All right, well, jumping right into it here. It's, um, I'm about a month behind, I think, with uh, putting together these videos, but uh, there's a bit of a reason for that. I'll get to that later. So what this mostly headless guy is doing here is setting up a countersink cage to countersink just under 600 holes in the horizontal stabilizer parts. So I actually filmed a little intro to this video where I joked about having made a huge mistake by actually counting the holes before, uh, before getting started. And that all seemed funny until I made a real mistake. And uh, now it's not so funny to make, to make a joke. So we'll get into that mistake in a little bit. Uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll cover what I'm going to try to do about it in the next video. But so here I am uh, setting up the countersink cage. I'm trying to set it up for uh, 332nd flush rivets, flush plus 7 thousandths, which is the recommended depth uh, for uh, countersink holes that are to accept a dimple in the skin as opposed to just you know, the head of the rivet itself. That's not quite deep enough to accept the full dimple, uh, but Vans has done some studies where they tried a bunch of different depths and sliced through it. Uh, took cross sections and then looked at how the aluminum sort of squishes together uh, when you when you set a rivet and came up with that flush plus seven thousandths. So uh, that's what I'm trying to set up here, and I'll also talk in a minute about uh, why I'm using my electric drill, which uh, turns out to be a mistake, but I'll get to that later, and uh, the countersink cutter and cage that I'm using. But so I think I pretty much got it dialed in here, and I'm testing it out. Is that for real? That does no not seem deep enough. Oh, yeah, it is. Look at that. Perfect. Okay. I like it. All right. Can't see a thing, I'm sure, but it's, it's good. It's not perfectly. There's a little tiny bit of wiggle which means it's not quite taking the whole dimple as is but there's no side to side that's good check this other one yeah all right all right, so I've got it all set up, got the depth set up on the cage uh, using the scrap parts, and now I can get going on the actual airplane parts. So I start off with the short stringer and do one of the holes and then test it out with you know some of my scrap and uh, try to measure it with my depth gauge, or my, um, I use a depth gauge on my set of calipers, which is really difficult to try to measure you know, anything that small with that little depth gauge. But uh, I already start to fiddle around and, and readjust the cage. And part of the problem, as you can see, <laughs> I'm really ashamed to even watch myself do these first few holes because I'm not supporting the part well at all. I'm just holding it in my hands. And uh, I don't know why I thought that was going to be a reasonable way to do it, uh, but it's not. You just can't be consistent uh, with this thing, and you'd think the cage would, you know, would keep you uh, keep you consistent all by itself, but it, it just doesn't, and uh, that's one of the problems I'm having here. Another problem, so I, I mentioned that I would talk about the cutter I'm using and the reason I'm using the electric drill. So I'm using the single-bladed countersink cutter uh, as opposed to the three-bladed cutter. I have one of each. And I'm using the, the, the single-bladed one because it doesn't have as much tendency to chatter, and it actually just makes a, it makes a much nicer cut. But it also really bites in, uh, and it makes a great cut if you can control it, but if you use the pneumatic drill, the pneumatic drill is good at going at very high speed, but it doesn't have any real low-end torque, so to speak, whereas an electric drill has plenty of low-end torque. It's an electric motor. So to, to use the countersink cutter, you really need to go slowly uh, and turn the drill relatively slowly. And the, the pneumatic drill is just not as good at that. And so that's why I'm using the electric drill. And so up to this point, I've been, you know, really finicky with the tool and checking it and, and adjusting it back and forth, back and forth. And none of the holes that I've drilled or countersunk have been in any way 
bad in that they're not going to compromise the integrity of the structure, nor would they even present a cosmetic problem. I'm just not happy with how consistent or inconsistent I seem to be, uh, the results I seem to be getting are, and part of the problem is it's hard to check them. It's really hard to sort of make this measurement that I'm making right here with the the caliper and depth, you know, the depth gauge I have on my caliper, and really I just want to get confident on the on these stringers, confident, so that I know that when I'm doing the spars, which are obviously a much more uh, elaborate and expensive part, uh, that I'm not going to screw those up. So I finally wise up here, and I back the uh, long stringers with a little block of wood clamped to the table. And uh, in some places I use a, a, a little aluminum shim taped to the block of wood to provide some support for the part of the cage that hangs over uh, off of the part a little bit. And that works a lot better. You can also see that I've switched to my pneumatic drill, which uh, presents its own set of problems. But uh, for the most part, I get much more consistent results and I'm, I'm happy with uh, how these work out on the long stringers until uh, until I get to the last holes on the ends. And uh, as I mentioned, I sort of have to get a running start with the pneumatic drill uh, when using the single bladed cutter, which uh, I figured out later that if I switch to the three bladed cutter, it wasn't, you know, it was easier to get good results with the pneumatic drill. But uh, for the most part, it's working okay. I just spend, you know, get the drill up to speed before I make contact with the part, and away I go. But when I get to these last holes on the end, no matter how much I, you know, shimmed around and tried to support the cage, I had a difficult time holding the drill uh, consistently, and I ended up making the holes, the countersinks, too deep. Uh, and one of them particularly bad on the end because the drill uh, it was actually the last one I did. And, you know, with each one, I, it got a little worse. The, the harder I tried, the worse it got. Uh, and so by the end, I'm pretty frustrated because I have clearly uh, messed up the, uh, the holes at the ends of these uh, long stringers. And so yeah, uh, you can see that here. Obviously the holes at the very ends of these stringers, uh, the countersink is larger diameter and deeper than the rest of the holes. And I have a couple options as, uh, you know, how I can fix this with these stringers, but, uh, you know, I really wanted to make sure that I was going to get consistent results and could, could figure out how to get consistent results before I started working on the spars. Uh, so that's what I'll talk about next. I'll talk about what I came up with because it ended up working out really well. And so if it isn't obvious, the trick to supporting these spars while you're countersinking is that, assuming you want to drill, you know, countersink down, uh, you need something that's going to support the underside of the top flange, uh, while the rest of the spar, the web and the lower flange and anything that happens to be attached to it at this point, like the, for example, the hinge brackets, as you can see here on the rear spar, all that stuff has to hang below whatever you're using to support uh, and, and countersink against. So I came up with a couple of, I tried a couple of different things, ideas. Uh, I, I built a couple of jigs out of two by fours that would sort of hold, you know, sit on the table, could be clamped or screwed to the table and would hold everything up. And, and finally ended up kind of going more simple and, uh, taking two strips of steel. That's what this, uh, is you can see in the foreground and just uh, clamping them to the table. This is just, you know, stuff I bought at the, the local big box hardware store. Uh, if I remember the dimensions correctly, it's, well, it's four feet long. The, the strips are four feet long, uh, two inches wide, and an eighth of an inch thick. And those dimensions aren't critical for this, but, uh, you know, it turns out they, they probably, well, they worked out pretty well. For one thing, uh, any thicker than, than one-eighth would have interfered with, uh, again, example here, the hinge brackets uh, under there on the rear spar, and any wider uh, would have gotten in the way of some parts uh, on, the, um, on the front spar. But, uh, so there's two of these strips. One of them, the one in the foreground, I'm using as an actual backer to support as I bear down with the countersink. Uh, cutter, and then the one in the in the in the background there is just being used as a support because obviously you know you, the spar is long and and you need something holding up 
you know, the other end as you work. And then my lovely assistant there is just keeping it from falling off the end and, and just keeping everything, you know, stable as I slide it along. Uh, as far as, you know, any additional preparation to these strips of steel, uh, I did uh, deburr them and clean them up a little bit. I didn't want the steel scratching the underside of the aluminum there. And I also would, I put a strip of just masking tape on there just to, again, to sort of protect the aluminum. On the one that I'm actually drilling against or countersinking against, I drilled a quarter inch hole in the end to provide relief for the pilot of the countersink cutter uh, bit, you know, the bit, the pilot for the countersink cutter, because it's going to stick down, it's going to protrude down beyond, uh, <laughs> I said 1 16th done, uh, I'll get to that. So yeah, the countersink cutter pilot is going to protrude through the hole, and, and if you didn't drill a hole in the steel, then it would have hit the steel and not allowed me to go deep enough. So I just drilled a quarter inch hole in the underside there so that I had some wiggle room uh, for that thing to come down through. And then the other thing I did was attach, you can kind of see it, and I'll show a close up later, I attached a strip of uh, just scrap aluminum that is the same thickness, or close enough, as the spar flange itself to, to be a backer or to, uh, how do I put this, to help support the part of the countersink cage that's, that's going to protrude over uh, the backside of the spar flange. Because just like the stringers, the spar flange is, is not as wide as the diameter or even the radius of the, the countersink cutter cage. So, uh, you know, you need something to help support it so you can keep it all stable. So that is just a little strip of uh, scrap aluminum that's the same thickness, and then I, I double-sided taped it to, um, you know, to the end of the steel. It gets a little more complicated when you're doing the front spar because the front spar, part of the front spar also uh, has the spar caps up under there, and so you have to sort of double up that aluminum, and, and that's exactly what I did. You can also see that I started using uh, these springy clamps, you know, clips, whatever, to hold everything. So I would just, you know, slide it to the next hole, let the clamp keep everything flat, and then I had both hands to be able to use the, use the drill in the cage. This worked really well. Um, it kept everything solid and stable, and I got good, consistent results. You can see that I am using the, the pneumatic drill, and what I've also done here is switched to the, uh, I've switched to the three-bladed countersink cutter, and so my initial thought, and the reason I held up that sign that said 1 16th done, when if you really think about it, I should be 1 8th done at this point, is I decided to not go all the way to flush plus seven thousandths on the first pass. I was too chicken to do that. What I decided I would do was I would use the three-bladed cutter, set the cage up for flush depth, and just do all these holes flush, and then come back in a second pass, do the initial or do the the additional seven thousandths with the single-bladed cutter when that way it wouldn't have very much to bite, it would make a nice, uh, clean countersink, and, uh, you know, that's how I was going to do it. And part of that came from having read forums and, and things where people, you know, kind of admit and say, yeah, you know, these countersink cages, they're, they're good, they do what they're supposed to do, but they're not perfect, you know, you're, you're just not going to always get perfectly consistent results down to the thousands if you're you know doing it all in one pass and i read more than one person commented that they the, the best they get the best results by sort of sneaking up on it and so uh that's what i had decided to do at least on this you know this on the rear spar um and that also allowed me to you know i figured that way i can use the three bladed cutter and then come back with the the nicer one bladed cutter later I said I would talk about why I had chosen to switch away from the electric drill and, and go with the pneumatic. So really that was because I discovered that my, you know, handheld battery powered trusty uh, Ryobi cordless drill, the chuck on that thing is a little bit out of whack and it's just not, doesn't drill perfectly centered. It wobbles a little bit and uh, I realized that it's perfectly fine for you know, around the house kind of chores. I'm not going to 
throw it away and buy a new drill or anything. It's not that bad. But, uh, you know, I've had that thing for years, probably dropped it off a ladder working on the house or whatever 20 times, and, you know, it's seen better days. Again, it's fine for household chores, but not really uh, what I want to be using for consistent precision airplane work. So I've gone back to my nice pneumatic drill and found that it's perfectly, uh, it works perfectly fine when using the three-bladed cutter and going slowly. So uh, that's what I proceed to do here. And again, this, now that I've got everything stable, I'm getting great results, everything's consistent, I get into a rhythm, and that's what I wanted. It actually worked so well that when I came back to do the additional 7,000th cut on this rear spar, I just stuck with the three-bladed cutter. And I've got nothing against the single-bladed cutter. It works just fine. It makes a nice cut, but this was working great. I wasn't getting any chatter, and I didn't want to mess with a good thing. So I stuck with it. And in fact, when I did the front spar, I did it all in one in one pass. I, uh, again, was getting such consistent results that I didn't feel like I needed to go to flush depth and then, you know, sneak up on it. So it all worked out just fine. So what am I going to do about the oversized holes in the ends of the long stringers? So I've got a couple of options. I've sort of eyeballed it, and I don't believe that the countersinks are so oversized as to be beyond the next size rivet up. So I should be able to just enlarge the holes, dimple the, you know, put a larger next size up dimple in the skin, and uh, go to a 1 8 rivet, and that should work just fine. It's, you know, if you're going to screw something up, doing it at the very end of a long stretch is is the best place to do it. And, uh, you know, so I, so I can do that. Another option, of course, would be to rebuy, uh, you know, buy replacement stringers and remake those stringers. And I'm not sure if that's what I want to do, but I actually did go ahead and order those parts from Vans. They weren't very expensive. Uh, I think either nine or twelve bucks uh, each for the long stringers. Uh, it was the shipping that gets you, really, because they've got to ship these long, skinny, uh, you know, parts that need to be well protected. Uh, so I've done that. The parts are here, and I really just need to weigh my options of what'll be the easiest thing to do to attempt to remake those parts and rematch drill them to the already dimpled skin, which will pose some challenges, uh, or, you know, just oversize the holes that I've got. So, still thinking about that, and that'll be the subject for the next video because this one's already got way too long. So here's the close-up again. Hopefully you can tell under the blue tape that I actually radiused the tip, the end of the steel uh, strip, so that it would tuck up under uh, and match the radius of the you know spar flange to web. Uh, you can see the cord wrench hole and you can see the aluminum strip that I had double-sided taped to the top as a shim. And I actually used the same, uh, I used the double-sided tape, the 3M stuff that I bought for uh, to use on the trailing edge of the rudder and then ended up using the tank seal instead. But uh, that tape's, it's, it's nice and thin but still real sticky so it actually worked really well here. Uh, and there you can see the part clamped in place. And here, uh, so this is the front spar, and you can maybe you can tell that there's a second shim just held in place with the masking tape on top of the first one, and that's to bridge uh, over where the spar cap uh, is, you know, doubling up the underside of the, the spar flange there. And you can see that I finally got clever enough uh, doing the front spar to put my shop vac uh, right there to catch the shavings because this produces a lot of uh, a lot of aluminum shavings doing these countersinks. And here uh, you can see where my wife was uh, you know so into it that she was able to perform her duties while reading her library book uh, and she's super happy I took that picture. And here are the final results so really happy with how these turned out now I just got to go back and fix those stringers. All right. Oh, that was my rivet. <laughs> I just, uh, I'm gonna step on that barefooted later. I'm sure of it.